Thank you, Lord, for your love, for your goodness towards us. We certainly pray for those in our congregation who are suffering through illness, physical, mental, emotional, or otherwise. Uh, we know that uh, you use even those times of illness to teach us things about ourselves and, uh, and about you. And so I pray that you would certainly give us that strength. Lord, I, I certainly uh, feel out of season this morning, uh, we'll say. And uh, we know that you still have something to say through this through this broken old vessel of mine. So I thank you that you're here, that you care, and thank you for your word here this morning. I ask just for your strength and for your conviction and that we would be able to examine ourselves here this morning uh, to see where we're at with you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, John 3. We'll, again, we'll finish John 3 on Easter Sunday. And I think, I, I think for Good Friday what we're going to talk about is <clears throat> why blood? You're wondering, what's that going to be about? Well, we'll find out. I haven't prepared it either, but it'll be good. What's this deal about power in the blood and being washed by the blood? I'm just thinking about that. Maybe we'll talk about that together. So here's a question for you. How would you react if you discovered <coughs> that everything you thought you knew was actually wrong? That the assurance you had of your salvation was actually false? Would you follow where the truth led you? Or would you get angry, double down, and reject the truth uh, that has been presented to you? I think how someone reacts when presented with the truth uh, tells us a lot about a person. And we're going to learn about one of these people and how they react in this very famous story of Nicodemus <coughs> in John chapter 3. We'll read this again, though Andy just did it. Who here has read John 3? Okay, it's a pretty powerful passage if we really take the time to study. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs unless that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. <clears throat> so it mentions here that Nicodemus is a Pharisee. It mentions that he's a ruler of the Jews. This means that he's in leadership. It means that he's important. Now, it's interesting that he's a Pharisee because the Pharisees are often what in Scripture to Jesus? His enemies, right? They often oppose him. And yet this man comes to see uh, Jesus. This is apparently a man who had seen what Jesus has done and is looking for some answers. Uh, and he is clearly seeking out Jesus here. But my question as I sort of studied through this is, is he prepared uh, for what Jesus is about to say to him? Verse 2 is, as well is important to know uh, that he came to Jesus by night. By night. I don't know exactly why this is, probably just because Jesus was too busy during the day. But I suspect there's more to this. If you were to go, to go ahead in John to 9.22, this is that story of the blind man being healed, being healed and his parents being brought in before the leaders. And this is just a portion, but here is what was going on at the time. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had agreed already that if anyone confessed that he, that is Jesus, was Christ, he will be put out of the synagogue. Being put out of the synagogue in that culture meant you're out of society completely, not just that you can't go to church on Sunday, by the way. Um, and so being seen with Jesus, I think, would have costed Nicodemus something, which is interesting when later Jesus' body is taken off of the cross, and who comes forward to help? Nicodemus. So is he believing at this point? I don't know. We know he believes later. I think also being a leader of the Jews, the cost would have been quite high, financial and social status and so forth. And so this did take some courage to come to Jesus, but the fact that it happens at night, I think, is significant. Now by calling Jesus a teacher who has come from God, and, and mentioning the signs that Jesus was doing, this shows us that he did have some belief, but I don't think it's complete or full belief. I don't think he truly understands who Jesus is yet, though I think he does. And I 
think, and maybe you'll disagree with me, but as he says this sort of, we know you've come from God and, and the signs you're doing, I wonder if he's being genuine here. I'm, I'm wondering if there is not some flattery in his words. Right? Like, 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 like is, is he truly convinced of what he's saying, or is he just trying to gain an advantage with his words? I don't know. But right now I see a half-heartedness in him, and as this conversation continues, maybe you'll agree with me. Now Jesus, as he always tends to be, is so bewildering here, he doesn't even really engage with what Nicodemus is saying. He doesn't say, thank you. Oh yeah, I know I'm doing great things. He cuts to the chase, and he tells him not what he wants to hear, but what he needs to hear. Maybe this is what you need to hear as well. He tells him that unless he is born again, that he cannot even see the kingdom of God. Now, the kingdom of God is sort of a nebulous term in Scripture. In the book of Matthew, it's called the kingdom of heaven. In the other books, it's called the kingdom of God. If you talk to ten different people, you might get ten different answers. What did Nicodemus likely have in mind when this phrase was shared? Probably Old Testament prophecy of Messiah coming and ruling and reigning on the earth. Okay? That's probably what he was thinking. And again, this was again many, a reason why many Jews rejected Jesus, because they expected him to come and overthrow the Romans, which he didn't do. Okay, so this is very interesting here. For Nicodemus, who again, he thinks he's a shoe in he thinks he's totally in, already in God's kingdom, to be told that he cannot even see it unless he is born again. I think was very shocking for him to hear, and we're going to see that in a minute. Because what Jesus is telling this man is that everything he has ever done for God is not good enough. His birth isn't good enough. His, his being a descendant of Abraham wasn't good enough. His lifetime of good works was not good enough. By the way, his works were much greater than yours and mine. To be a Pharisee, the first question they would ask you, as far as I understand, they would say, okay, you want to be a Pharisee? Okay, here's step one. Recite the book of Deuteronomy to me from memory. Anyone here do, able to do that? The book of Deuteronomy. Okay, some of us can't even find that in our Bible, and he could quote the whole thing. And yet Jesus is telling him, your life has been wasted, what you have done is irredeemable, and the only way you can see the kingdom of God is to be born again. But let's look at his response. <laughs> of course, taking him literally, as many people tend to do, Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? It's not what he's talking about. Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Many people believe water and the Spirit has to do with physical birth and spiritual birth. I don't think water has to do with water baptism, by the way. Just as a side note, those of you who have had children, you know, the water breaks, right? Water and spirit. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it, but you cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the spirit. So, of course, he takes Jesus too literally. And maybe what Nicodemus is thinking is, all right, maybe if I can be born one more time, I can do better the next time. I can try harder. And yet Jesus says, no, no. It is, is not physical birth. It is a spiritual birth, a spiritual rebirth. Nicodemus could have been reborn thousands of times. He would always end up falling short of God's standard. By the way, this, this, this proves reincarnation, the idea that when I die, I come back to life, and there's a cycle of life, and Someday, somewhere, I'll work off my sin, work off my karma, as it were. And Jesus is telling us here, that's impossible. Even if you had a million lives, you would never work off, we would never work off your sin. Because everything that is born of the flesh is flesh. The result will always be the same. And so to be born again is not a physical rebirth. It is a spiritual awakening in a person's life where their spirits that were separated from God are made alive and rejoined in relationship with God. Is that something you can do on your own? Absolutely not. And he talks here in verses 7 and 8 of this mystery of being born again. We don't completely understand how the spirit works 
in the lives of people. But we can't predict his path, but we can see the results of his work. And so if you have come to know the Lord in your life, uh, you probably can't trace all the steps it took you to get there, but you can see the change in your life. You know something's different. This is what he's talking about. The wind blows where it wishes. What does it mean to be born again? It's interesting here. Jesus just throws out this term and never even explains it. Luckily, we have the rest of the New, of the New Testament to help us understand a little bit more. Let me read you two verses here that talk about this. Titus 3, 4-6. to six, Again, very powerful verse. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Look what he says here. Through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. Ephesians 2, 4-7. to But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. He made us alive. That's what he's talking about when he talks about being born again. Ephesians 2, you can re read the rest of that for yourself. Verse 9, Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen. Very interesting. He's speaking in the plural, almost like the Trinity is talking. Very interesting. And you do not receive our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the Son of Man who is in heaven, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the, must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. This man is in shock. He says, how can this be? This tells me that he understands what Jesus is saying. This Pharisee is looking back on his life of dedication to God and good works and his head knowledge about the law and his obedience to it, and yet Jesus tells him that none of it is good enough. I think I've quoted this before, but it was widely taught uh, among the Jews at that time uh, that since they descended from Abraham, uh, they were automatically assured of heaven. In fact, some rabbis taught that Abraham stood watch at the gates of hell just to make sure that none of his descendants would accidentally wander inside. Guaranteed heaven if you're a Jew. But that wasn't a belief that came from Scripture. It was a man-made tradition. So here's the thing about Nicodemus. As good of a man as he was, good. He was a man full of pride and self-sufficiency. He was a self-righteous man who thought he was safe from the judgment of God because he was such a good person. But here's the thing. He couldn't have been more wrong. Charles Spurgeon said this, The greatest enemy to human souls is the self-righteous spirit which makes men look to themselves for salvation. Isn't that exactly what Nicodemus was doing? Looking to himself for salvation. What's ironic about this whole story is that Nicodemus should have known better. He was one of the primary teachers of Israel, and yet he doesn't even realize or understand those new covenant passages that Jesus is referring to. Because Jesus isn't making something up. He's actually referring to the Old Testament that said this would happen. Let me read these passages to you because they're just so powerful and so good. Jeremiah 31, 33 to 34. So again, Nicodemus knew his Bible. He should have known this. Look what God promised would come. And Jesus says, you need to be born again. Uh, Jeremiah 31. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. And here's the kicker. For I will forgive their iniquity, and their sin I will remember no more. Nicodemus should have known that passage. Ezekiel 36 Again, 
24 to 28, he says, For I will take you from among the nations, gather you out from all the countries, bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a what? A new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. Then, you'll, then you shall dwell in the land, he says. So again, Nicodemus should have known that he needed a new heart. But he thought just being a Jew, he was already a, a, a recipient of the new covenant. But he was not. He was not, at least not yet. Very interesting here, verses 11 and 12, if you look in your Bible, this is why I think Nicodemus doesn't quite believe yet, because Jesus tells him, you and the rest of your Pharisees have rejected God's witness about me. He tells him, you have rejected me at this point. Now later on, I think he believes, but not yet. He has to go home and think. This is going to cost him big time. He has to think about this. Of course, I love verse 13. He says, the only one who knows what heavenly things is the one who came down from it. While men like Enoch and Elijah were taken up to heaven while still alive, and neither of them have come down to tell us about it. Uh, later on, the apostle Paul apparently sees the third heaven, but he refuses to say anything about it, calling it unlawful to do so. It's only Jesus, the Son of God, who has forever dwelled in heaven with his Father, who can correctly tell us about heavenly things. And you want to know what Jesus talks about much more than he talks about heaven? He talks about hell a lot more than he talks about heaven. Very interesting. Of course, he says in verses 14 and 15, the familiar story you're probably familiar with, as Moses, Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. We'll talk more about this on Easter morning. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Strange story in the Old Testament. You're, fam you're familiar the Jews are in the wilderness. They're sinning against God again. What, what begins to happen to them? Poisonous snakes begin biting them and killing them. And then God commands Moses to do something very strange. And without Jesus being this picture of this, it doesn't really make much sense. He says, make a bronze serpent, put it on a pole, and, and lift it up. Why is he lifting it up? It's a picture of the cross, of course. And he says, whoever looks at it will be healed. All a person had to do was look up and they were healed from poison. It, it sounds so ridiculous, and many of them probably said, ah, and yet the ones who looked were healed. And, and this is such a good story to reference because, again, what do we do to be saved? The religious people say laws and do's and works, and yet Jesus says, look to me and be saved. So let's talk about three things. When I use the word regeneration, it's a fancy Bible school word that just means being born again. It means when God makes us spiritually alive when we put our trust in him. First of all, very important to point this out, the necessity of regeneration. The necessity of regeneration. Jesus is clear here, so clear in this passage, that if we want to enter into or even see the kingdom of God, we must be born again. Have you been born again? See, it isn't optional, and, and being born again isn't meant for some special class of Christian. All people who want to enter into God's presence must be born again. Why? Because we were born in Adam. We need to be born in Christ. We, we, are, we must be made alive. Why? Because we are born spiritually dead. We must be given new hearts. Why? Because we are born with sinful hearts. We must be cleansed of our sins. Why? Because without that, we will never be able to enter into God's presence, at least not in relationship. We can enter into his presence for judgment momentarily, but that's about it. How does one become born again? That's the hard part, isn't it? You don't make that happen. We know the requirement for salvation is faith in Jesus Christ, that we are to turn from our sin and trust in Jesus. But for a person to do that, of course, a work of God must happen in their heart. One thing is for sure, we must repent and believe the gospel if we are to be saved and we will be held responsible for our rejection of Christ. I wanted to bring this up quickly, modern-day counterfeits of regeneration. What's so interesting uh, about the spiritual truths in the Bible is that Satan almost always makes a counterfeit version of that truth. 
Here's the interesting thing about the devil. He can't make anything new. All he can do is take what God has made and twist it. Gender, marriage, love, sex, being born again. The Bible, he, he takes it and he twists it. And so it's important to note that there are all kinds of other, we'll call them, spiritual awakenings in other religions, whether it be the Mormon. They will say to you, who, who here has ever talked to a Mormon missionary? Okay? They will tell you, pray about this, ask God to reveal himself that the Book of Mormon is true, that Joseph Smith is a prophet, and God will prove it to you by giving you a burning in your chest. You'll get a burning feeling in your chest. It's a spiritual experience. And they will say, I am convinced that it's true. Why? Because I had a burning in my chest. Did you have heartburn? Maybe you just needed to take a tongue. Okay. You're basing your faith on that? Hindus have incredible ecstatic experiences. And they say that proves that what I believe is true. Even the secular world now has a counterfeit born again. Do you want to know what it's called? Wokeness. Wokeness. If you're older, you don't really know what I mean, but you, you, you've seen it. Maybe you just don't know the word. Wokeness is defined as a state of being aware, especially of social problems such as racism and inequality. What's very interesting about modern-day wokeness, modern-day, we'll call it hyper-liberalism, though I don't even like using the, the political term, what's funny about wokeness is it's actually its own religion. It has leaders. It has its own set of beliefs. It has those who are in and those who are out. Those who are in look down on those who are out. Does that sound like a religion to you? They even have their own evangelists, people who go on the TV shows, who go to the campuses and so forth, and they spread their message of equality and equity for all. It's a false gospel, just like every other false gospel. They even have their own version of a spiritual awakening when a person becomes aware that there's injustice in the world and that all white people are racist by birth, by the way, they would say. And by the way, they are just as militant and aggressive as any other false religion in the world. What God creates, Satan counterfeits. So here's the thing. There are many religions in the world, many who are zealous about their beliefs, other people who have had maybe even deeper spiritual experiences than you and who have seen even more than you. How do you know you're right and they're wrong? Because we don't base our faith off of something we've experienced. We believe in Christianity because it's true. Amen? Like Christ rising from the dead is a historical fact. It's, it's, it's true. So even if I don't feel something, it doesn't matter. It's true. There's my rabbit trail for the week. The assurance of regeneration. How can we know for sure that we've been born again and that if we were to die today that we would enter into God's kingdom? Here's some questions for you to give, hopefully give you some assurance. You've heard these before. First question, have you trusted in Jesus alone for your salvation? Simple question. You guys remember Garvin? Gobert? Some of you know him. How long did he attend here before he was born again? Ian? How many years was he here before he was born again? Being in a church means nothing as far as being born again, right? Have you personally reached out to Christ in faith and have you asked him to save you? so dangerous being raised in a Christian home, having Christian parents, you know the lingo, you know the culture, you know the language, and maybe you have everyone else in your life fooled, but there's only one person you haven't fooled, and that's God. Is that you? Have you mixed in good works or personal merit with your faith? You say, yeah, I trust in Jesus, but I'm actually also a pretty good person, and Jesus is really happy to have me on his team. Is that you? Charles Spurgeon said, it is not great faith, but true faith that saves. And the salvation lies not in the faith, but in the Christ in whom faith trusts. 
It is not the measure of faith, but the sincerity of faith, which is the point to be considered. I can have great faith in a chair. It doesn't mean it'll save me. Who is your faith in? That's what matters. Here's a second question that's just as significant. What has happened to you since trusting in Christ? When you placed your faith in Christ, what happened to you? Was there a change in your heart and life? If not, you have to wonder if you've been truly born again. Because I think going from death to life should be a significant shift <laughs> in your life, right? Now, maybe you believe when you were very young and you may not see such dramatic changes maybe an older person might get, but the fruits of salvation should still be there nonetheless. And so maybe the question for you, a uh, person who got saved very young, is has God changed you and is he continuing to change you today? Here's another question. Do you love God? Not the concept of God. Not even the Bible. Do you love God? Ha has such a tr uh, change been wrought in you that you now love the God you used to hate? That you now look towards the God you were once indifferent towards? Some people, when giving their testimonies, will say things like, I believed in God as long as I can remember, and I've always loved God. And yet, that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible doesn't teach that you've always loved God. Maybe the question for you is, is that love you have for God increasing it each day, or is it becoming familiar and stagnant? Have you lost your first love? Is your knowledge of his love for you growing day by day, year by year? Does it continue to blow your mind that he loves you? Another good question maybe to think about is, do you hate your sin? When you fall into sin, how does that make you feel? What happens in your heart and in your conscience when that happens? Do you make excuses? Do you justify it? Do you ignore it? Do you grieve the Holy Spirit? Or are you disgusted with yourself? Do you see your flesh for what it is? Or has your conscience become so dull that you feel nothing? Do you make excuses for your sin? Or do you abuse the grace of God, assuming that you will be okay if you continue doing what you're doing? If that's the case, you have believed a lie, and you should go home and read Romans 6. You cannot continue in that way. If you are, you are proving something about yourself. Are you self-righteous to the point where you think you have no sin? 1 John says that if we claim to have no sin, we are liars. And so are you lying to others and to yourself about the unrepentant sin in your life? Do you have a desire to grow in your faith? Or are you satisfied just the way you are? You say, I've, you know, I've grown a bit. I'm happy where I am. Are you satisfied? Are you content with how far you've come? Or are you still hungry for more? Even if you've seen some of those changes in your life happen in the past, the next question is, is do you still have a hunger and a, and a desire to grow in your faith? Do you want to know him better? Are you interested in the word of God? Do you want to learn and grow in your faith? Or again, has your faith become stagnant? Have you hit a plateau? Have you hit a brick wall? That happens from time to time, but what are you going to do about it is the question. Not that it doesn't happen, it's what do you do? Have you allowed the lies of this world uh, to creep, to so creep into your life that you're not really believing God like you used to? I'm dead serious when I say this, and maybe this is me this morning. But maybe there are some of you here who are just barely hanging on in your faith. What can we do to encourage you in your walk with the Lord today? That's why we're here. How can we encourage you to hang on? What needs to change in your life starting today? What assurance do you have that you have truly been born again? What assurance do you have that your faith is real? James, the uh, brother, half-brother of Jesus, he talks about dead faith. How do you know that you don't have dead faith? He talks about the faith of demons. Demons apparently have faith. They believe in God and tremble, it says. Nevertheless, it's useless to save them. Is that, the kind, is that the kind of faith that you have? Is your assurance only based on a one-time past decision? Is your only assurance of salvation that you prayed a prayer to ask Jesus into your heart at one time in your life? 
How do you know for sure that he came into your life if there is no other evidence of him dwelling there? Are you continuing to grow in your faith and your trust in Christ even today? Is God continuing to break you even now in your life? Is he molding you? Is he shaping you? Is he purifying you? Or do you just like to play religion on Sunday? Good question for me and for you, I think. I'll finish by saying this. The biggest evidence that you have been born again, as Jesus says we must, isn't just that there were some changes in your life way back then. It's that you are continuing to change and to grow in your faith today. Is that you? Is that you here this morning? Let's pray. Dear God, your word was piercing this morning, thinking about what Jesus had to say to this Pharisee. We can certainly relate to him, not totally understanding everything maybe in the way we should. I pray, God, that, we would help to, that you would help us to examine our hearts this morning, that we wouldn't be satisfied uh, just being where we're at, but that we would be maybe dissatisfied in a holy way um, with where we're at. I pray for each one here that you would bring spiritual growth and encouragement into their lives. For those who are doing well, that you would continue to give them strong, uh, that you would continue to keep them strong, that, that they would give that strength to others in need, to others here maybe who are hanging on to their faith just by a thread. I pray, God, that you would lift them up, that you would be the lifter of their heads here uh, this morning. Those, those who feel like they have no hope, God, that you would give them hope today. As Romans 5 says, Holy Spirit, that you would, you would pour out your love into our hearts to the point where we change. For without that, there is no hope for us. There is no hope for us to not only get to heaven, but to have any sort of joy, meaning, or purpose in this life. So thank you, Jesus, that you are real, that you are a historical person who lived and died and rose again, that we don't have to doubt that anymore. We don't have to believe the lies of the world of, of people who don't even know what they're talking about who say the Bible's not true. No, we know it's true. That's been established so clearly even in this past month in our Sunday time. So help us, Lord, to trust you and grow in our faith, even when it's hard, even when it costs us something, even when we're a little embarrassed, even when maybe family or coworkers or friends or neighbors laugh at us. Help us to stand for you, just like we saw in a tiny little way at the men's retreat with men walking through that far with the Bible and singing hymns next to a karaoke night with a bunch of drunk people. God, you uh, have called us to be light and salt in a world that is very dark and very much tasteless. So thank you, God, that it is Easter week, Easter season. Be with us as we come back for Good Friday. Be with us as we're meeting together for Easter Sunday, and we thank you and praise you for who you are. In Jesus' name, amen.